Welcome, one and all, to another episode of the Cool Words podcast with me, your host, Professor David Kipping, right here at Columbia University in the heart of New York City. So today, I'm pretty excited. We have a very special guest joining me, and that is the legendary Professor Wendy Friedman. Her name really speaks for itself in the field of cosmology. She's won all of the prizes you can think of, really, when it comes to cosmology, she's from the Gruber Prize of Cosmology. She's been awarded as a AAS Legacy Fellow and also elected to the National Academy of Sciences and many, many more prizes that I don't have time to list for this introduction. But suffice to say, she is really about as much of an expert as you could possibly be on this subject. Her work is pivotal to the very foundations of what we now call modern physical cosmology. So, for example, she was an architect of one of the most important experiments, I would say, in all of physical cosmology, and that was the key project that the Hubble Space Telescope undertaken. It was the first serious attempt to measure the expansion rate of the universe using the Hubble Space Telescope that led to an ultra-precise measurement of its rate, and then eventually led to deep insights about the nature of the universe itself. We'll be talking about that experiment in particular during this podcast, because it turns out in recent years, that measurement and subsequent refinements of that measurement have become somewhat controversial. We now have two, in fact, even three different ways of measuring the expansion rate of the universe. You hope they would all agree with each other, but they don't. And this has given birth to what is commonly called the crisis in cosmology, also known as the Hubble tension. Hubble tension because this expansion rate of the universe itself is called the Hubble constant. So today we're going to dive into this topic with Wendy Freeman, who is really one of the best people to speak about on this because she is literally running these experiments, doing these measurements and leading the teams and has decades of experience seeing how this field has evolved. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation. I hope you learn a lot. And with that, please enjoy today's podcast. So I'm, I was really excited to have you join us because, you know, you have formidable expertise in two projects, which I'm very fascinated by, these giant telescopes that we're all getting interested in, these 30 meter class telescopes. And you obviously were down in the ground early on in those. And then, of course, also, we've, we've been hearing about it over the last few years, this crisis in cosmology, or maybe there's not a crisis in cosmology. And you, of course, have also been in the forefront there. So I want to talk about both of those. But... You've had such a long, illustrious career that maybe we should just step back and start with um, how has cosmology transformed since you know you were starting your PhD, University of Toronto? Yes. And what was the state of cosmology like back then? What were the problems people were interested in? And how has it evolved in that time since? Yeah, I think way back, it, it was very different when I started. <laughs> so what I uh, have spent a lot of my career doing is measuring how fast the universe is expanding, a mm. quantity called the Hubble constant. And when I started, um, it, so the Hubble constant describes the, the rate at which the universe is expanding now, and it therefore gives you a measure of the age of the universe and its size. So there was a debate at the time that I started about whether the universe was 10 billion years old or 20 billion years old. Mm. And literally, we did not know this quantity better than a factor of two. So wow. that's a, not a very good position to be yeah. in. And it has enormous implications for other areas in cosmology and properties of galaxies and stars and their distances and so on. And so um, at the time, uh, this... It predates a lot of what happened with measurements of the microwave background and precision cosmology that we talk about today. We had just um, exited the era where the the detector for astronomy was the glass astronomical plate, hmm. and uh, notoriously bad for making accurate measurements because they were nonlinear devices. And so things like charge coupled devices, CCDs, which we now sort of take for granted, they're in our cell phones, that we, the cameras that we use, had just become available for scientific use um, at, on large telescopes. And so we were able to make measurements for the first time that were much more accurate than 
was possible with photographic plates. So, so during the span of my career, I've really been able to see a huge sea change in the accuracy with which we could make measurements. And Did this preceded, sorry, uh, one of the things preceded the Hubble Space Telescope where we could get above the Earth's atmosphere. And so mm. I feel very fortunate to have come along at a time where there was just a huge change in our capability and, and the, the possibility of making measurements with really high accuracy. So it sounds like it's been, I mean, you are obviously, you live in an, you are an observer, I would say mostly, but those, those are all technical breakthroughs, such as the CCD and the Hubble Space Telescope. And so has, has cosmology, in, in your opinion, largely been driven by the observational um, advances? rather than the theoretical advances? I think when fields do really well, it, it's at a time of, of flowering when you have both theory and observations or experiment that are confronting each other. So if mm. you only have theory that's untested by observations, or you only have observations without the context of, of eventual understanding of what is leading to the observations, it it is really important to have both, particularly in a field like cosmology. And so I think what made this a really fruitful era was the development, for example, the theory of inflation that came around in the 1980s that mm. described a really rapid period of expansion early in the universe. Um, the idea, which was theoretical for a while, that we lived in a, a universe that had a flat geometry, that is, um, and the idea at that time was that we were dominated by matter in the universe. Um, then observations came along and said, hey, wait a minute, there's actually this thing called dark energy, which we don't yet understand. Um, but it wasn't simply a matter-dominated universe. And observers had been saying that for a long time. Um, but again, uh, there was a confluence of both theory and observations and very different kinds of experiments that put very strong constraints on what we now think of as our standard model of cosmology. So. Uh, yeah, a lot happened in a short period of time, and it was driven both by technology, I would say, as well as theoretical developments. And, you know, going back again to when you first began, so there, was there a concept of dark, was it hypothesized dark matter or even dark energy at that time, or were these more uh, invented after the fact to sort of solve the problem, or were there predictions of these things? Uh, well, you know, the idea of uh, dark matter, of course, goes back to the 1930s with Fritz Wicke at Caltech who made mm. measurements of the velocities of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Mm -hmm. And what he saw was that the galaxies were moving much faster than they would have if there wasn't more matter there to hold them bound to the cluster. They just would have flown off long ago. And that remained a mystery for decades. And, and even though there were hints of it, there was um, Horace Babcock at Carnegie who made measurements of the velocities of stars in the Andromeda galaxy and noticed that the stars had a high velocity way out uh, far mm -hmm. from the center of the galaxy, again indicating something missing there. But no one had a good explanation for it, so it was kind of almost, it was ignored. Um, and then in the 70s, suddenly again uh, led by technology and the ability to measure so-called rotation curves of galaxies where Vera Rubin um, measured the velocities of stars in many, many galaxies far out, and they had these flat rotation curves, again, signaling that there was matter out there that we couldn't see. Mm -hmm. and then uh, X-ray telescopes became available above the atmosphere again, so a discovery of hot gas that was there, which would have evaporated long ago if there wasn't more matter there. And then the microwave background consistent with dark matter. So there's so many different um, directions now where the evidence from dark matter has come in that even though we don't know what it is there's never been a particle discovered in a laboratory or mm -hmm. the evidence has come from astronomical um, measurements um, the evidence is overwhelming that there's something there that we just don't see we only see its effects on the luminous matter where we can make measurements um, the effect that this matter has on, on what we do see yeah and it must be a challenge to communicate that to the public. And when we, you know, I work in the field of exoplanets, obviously, and when we talk about discoveries, we can show an artist's impression of what this beautiful, maybe Earth-like planet looks like, and people know what that means. You know, they can understand what a planet is, what a new world is, and imagine the vistas there. It's very challenging, I would imagine, to do science communication in cosmology, where there are so many of these concepts that um, you can't, hold it in your hand. You can't even imagine what this thing looks like. Um, do you agree or do you think that the 
the the fundamental appeal of cosmology outweighs those challenges and so it 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 persists and it thrives despite those despite the uh, the the ephemeral nature almost of some of the things that you're looking at i, I think both of those <laughs> pictures are right in a sense i think it, it is hard sometimes to describe and we haven't even talked about dark energy yet which is even harder concept to get mm. your head around right so not only is there more matter than we knew about but there's this invisible um, energy that's causing the universe to speed up in its expansion. So Edwin Hubble's discovery of the expansion was crazy enough, right? We mm -hmm. don't live in a static universe that's expanding. We can't see that, right? But we can't see the Earth going around the sun either, right? So there are many things in science that they they go against our common sense, common, you know, what we see that makes sense to us um, and that we've learned about by careful observation and experiment. But at the same time, I think even though sometimes that's challenging to explain, it is the mysterious that, you know, we're humans fascinated by things that are mysterious. And, and it's almost like a detective story. What can we learn by asking questions and then no, our assumptions were wrong and we have to change our picture of how we look at the world. And, mm. but I think, you know, for me, that's one of the things that I love about science is that it's a, constantly asking questions and you can be wrong, right? It can take 2,000 years before we change our view of the, the cosmos that, you know, no, the Earth is not stationary, even though we feel it is, um, but we're moving around the sun and, and it's observation and experiment that mm -hmm. force you to confront what the universe is actually like. So we keep pushing the boundaries of our knowledge and then we find more mysteries, but that's sort of the, the beauty of it also, I think. Yeah, and it's, a, it's had so many like pulling the rug under your belief system of the universe, right? We've, we've seen that happen so many times. We've already spoke about, obviously, you know, the, the spiral galaxies and their spin rates being evidence for dark matter early on. And that was obviously, must have been a jarring observation at the time, I imagine. Um, but obviously, that was before your career. But in your in your own career, I can think of maybe dark energy might be an example. But are there other revelations that you have witnessed that for you are almost like the you know, the moment where you almost remember where you were when, when you heard these discoveries or when these ideas first started to float around that really influenced you as a cosmologist? I think, you know, going back to this period where uh, inflation was proposed, where this confluence of measurements in cosmology came together. Um, when I started, just as an example, um, the director, two directors, in fact, where I worked, said you don't want to work on the Hubble constant because we know what the age of the universe is because we can measure the ages of the oldest stars in the universe. We know mm -hmm. how old they are and so um, if you get an age from cosmology, um, if it doesn't agree you must be wrong. Mm -hmm. So why don't you work on something else that's more fruitful? And, and I think what we learned was, yeah, there was this discrepancy with the ages of the globular clusters and how that got resolved was eventually with the discovery of the acceleration of the universe. Mm. So the, the controversy was you, if you measured how fast the universe was expanding and our first observations with Hubble indicated a universe that was younger than the oldest stars in our Milky Way galaxy, which is obviously a contradiction, right? Mm. You can't be younger than your... I mean, your grandmother is older than you are, right? You right. can't. Um, Unless you have a time. There, there's a there's an order to things, <laughs> yeah. and You'd hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, Einstein had predicted, in fact, uh, or at least added a, a term into his equation for general relativity in 1915 that forced the universe to be static because that was the expectation. He did talk to observers at the time. We didn't even know about the existence of other galaxies. That came with Edwin Hubble in, in the 1920s uh, and the expansion in 1929. And so he forced the universe to be static. He knew that it either had to expand or contract. Uh, when the, the discovery of the acceleration was made, that in fact is Einstein's cosmological constant. It's mm. allowed in general relativity to have acceleration, not just um, deceleration because of gravity. And so um, for me, it was, again, being led by the, the data, right? People were saying, this is crazy. The cosmological constant had reared its head many times over the time since Einstein first proposed it. And Einstein rejected it when Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe. 
And he apparently said that this was his biggest blunder because he'd had the opportunity to predict the expansion and he didn't. He didn't listen to what his equations were saying. Um, and so this was just an example of, okay, at, at the time theorists were saying we lived in this universe, it was dominated by matter. Um, and uh, so the Hubble constant had to have a certain value or you wouldn't be in agreement with the theory. And then the observations came along, it completely turned things on its head. People suddenly realized, okay, there is this evidence for a cosmological constant. The ages of the oldest stars suddenly became consistent with what we were measuring for the expansion. And the whole picture, our observational mm. uh, picture and theoretical picture, a standard cosmology emerged that people were ridiculing only year, you know, a few years before <laughs> that. So things can change. And, and it's very accurate data that force you to change uh, what you're thinking. It, if you confront what the universe is actually doing and it doesn't match what you predicted, well, then you discard the theory. It's interesting how often that happens. I, I feel like in planetary science, exoplanetary science, there was a similar pattern where people who were working on it early on were kind of ridiculed for work on expanse before the first discoveries. And it was only when we had 51 Pegasi B discovered that everyone kind of in reflection would look back and say, oh, no, I always knew there were planets there. Of course there was planets there. And everyone kind of changed their mind about it over, you know, the, the, not overnight, but over a short period of time. And so um, there are these transformations that happen. I'm kind of also interested in the, the opposite case where a discovery has been, I could think of cases again, exoplanets, where something is claimed that would be transformative but it ended up not being true. I mean, an example in particle physics might be, for instance, the OPERA experiment, right, where there was this idea that these neutrinos detected. And in that case, there was a lot of caution, of course, by the case of the, of, of the measures themselves, and they were, they were pretty good at claiming that. Have there been cases in cosmology where things have been claimed or been alluded to in the data, there's excitement about that then the rug was pulled back and we went back to reality. And, and how did that influence you as a scientist? Well, I think a recent example, there's an experiment called BICEP, which was trying to measure polarization in, in the background radiation from the Big Bang. And as uh, instrumentation has gotten better and better and better, it's been able, it's been possible to make uh, more accurate observations of tiny fluctuations in both the temperature and also the, the polarization of the background radiation. And, but these are exceedingly difficult measurements to make, and particularly of this kind of polarization. And so there was an early result that suggested that the polarization had been detected, a very interesting result for cosmology, but it turned out that the effects of dust uh, were too large to actually mm. make this measurement. So, so the, it literally the rug, the dust under the rug, <laughs> was swept out, and and so you know that's a measurement for the future. But uh, it's I think again a, uh, an indication that okay sometimes mistakes are made. You on you improve your measurements, and it's um, something that happens. And but it it happens. Yeah. But I feel like it must be important for our training as scientists to witness those moments. Yeah. Because you can, otherwise with the Hubble tension, the the, cosmo the crisis in cosmology that we'll speak about, if you were a young person, you might be overzealous in that, right? You might be excited about the opportunity of, of ripping down everything and starting new and new physics. That's what we always want is the new discoveries. And so um, I think, I kind of wish in our education as scientists, we focus more on those false positives, those false summits, because there is perhaps the most important lesson for objectivity. How do you reflect on objectivity in this? You're in the midst of what is a very con you know, big controversy. A lot of people are discussing this. We'll get into the details of it soon. But just from a broad perspective, when you're in those kind of um, hotly debated topics, um, are there things that you tell yourself to keep yourself grounded? Or what do you reflect on in those, in those discussions? I think the way I think about it is the universe is doing what it is doing, <laughs> independent of what we think, and also independent of what our technical capability is at the time. And so I'm not uncomfortable with the idea that maybe we don't even have the ability yet to make 
measurements at the level at which we need them to make certain claims. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm okay with that. I would prefer that we did. I would also, uh, I think, just natural to find it more interesting that there's new fundamental physics to be discovered than, well, we actually don't have the accuracy to, to say that or mm. um, that there are errors as there were due to dust that uh, are causing people to think that the uncertainties are smaller than they actually are. Mm. Um, that's not as interesting as a new fundamental discovery. But what motivates me is I'd really like to understand what the universe is doing, and I don't think I have any personal stake in what it is. I just want to understand what it is. And so I would much rather um, come to a realization, either you can't make the measurement or there's not fundamental physics, which is not as exciting, but it may be what the universe is actually doing. So I just try and do what I can to improve the measurements. And I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. And, yeah. and I hate the idea of thinking that I would become wed to a number of value that may have nothing to do with the universe. So, you know, I've asked my husband to shoot me. <laughs> you know, they shoot horses, don't they? Send me out to pasture if I if I end up in that corner. <laughs> so. the, yeah, there's a part in every university building where <laughs> where <laughs> professors are sent in that case. Um, that I agree. That that makes the universe just is the way it is, and it's our job just to go out and look at it. Um, and if you look back in times of history, there are times where people were trying to make measurements, but they just didn't have the capability of doing right. it at the accuracy that you want, right? So that's a very human desire to do something now because you're doing it. Um, you know, you don't want to think you're wasting your time, but I, I hope we're moving the science forward, and I think we are, but sometimes there's a tendency to try and rush things because, you know, you want, want it to be done and finished and you want the answer to the story, but there's no answer at the end of the textbook, right? right? Yeah. The a science textbook, you go look it up and then you know whether you got the right answer. We don't know what the right answer is. The universe is yeah. you know, doing what it does, but we don't know that until we can make accurate measurements. So. Yeah. And I, it kind of reminds me of um, a saying that Feynman had about uh, the universe being like an onion, perhaps that you know there may not be some simple single breakthrough you know maybe you imagine that with James Webb or the, the successor to one of these large telescopes that there will be some precision we reach that will reveal all of the mysteries and and, and you will think okay we're done with cosmology but perhaps it, it is more just like an onion that you just keep peeling away and there's no bottom and every generation will continuously find new do, do you have a i mean you're an observer so maybe you, you want to be agnostic about that but i know you're probably pushed by many theorists who are appealed by the, the very simple elegant universe idea of a single equation do you, do you try and just kind of leave leave the theorists out of your ears when you're when you're looking yeah, at your data? You know, i think a theory can be beautiful and elegant and also wrong <laughs> and you know the einstein disorder universe that was matter dominated is an example of that right so i don't think you can be um Again, I don't think you want to be um, swayed by a particular theory. You really want to test it. And that's the beauty of having both theory and observations that confront each other. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I'm particularly attracted to problems that, that you do have that interface. And Well, let's talk about the key project. This was obviously a formative part of your own career, formative part of cosmology in general. In hindsight, you know, it it seems to be a huge success as a project. Um, and I guess what I'm curious about is, first of all, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the background of the project. How, how, how was it conceived? Um, what were the challenges imagined at the time? What was it trying to do, perhaps at a basic level as well? And I'm curious, it seems like such a slam dunk project in hindsight, but at the time, did it seem like this is very risky and we're putting a lot on the line to even attempt this? Yeah. So um, <laughs> you asked how it came to be, and, and the genesis of the project was start there, yeah. the um, director at the time of the Space Telescope Science Institute, Ricardo Giacconi, asked the community to come up with projects, he called them key projects, that could only be done by Hubble. And it, also, if Hubble were to fall into the ocean after you know a year or whatever, what were the high priority projects that we would really regret not having done if we didn't take advantage of that new capability. And he was concerned that the process by which we decide on who gets time on the telescope involves 
peer review where you get together a group of, of scientists who, who rank the proposals that are submitted. And because we had waited decades to get a telescope above the atmosphere, he, he knew that this was going to be highly oversubscribed. And he thought the tendency of any time allocation committee would be to divide up the time in tiny little pieces. So he wanted to allocate some projects uh, that he called key projects and allocate them a lot of time that could only, only Hubble could do those projects. And he put together a I think they called it a gray beard committee at that time. And, and mm. that was probably more accurate than, <laughs> than now. It's like but... Gandalf's like, deciding <laughs> what to do with the time, right? That's what I'm imagining. Um, and so, and, and one of the projects that was uh, recommended by the committee was, was the measurement of the Hubble constant or the expansion rate of the universe. And so the community was invited to propose to compete for the key projects. And so uh, our group got together at a meeting in As Aspen at the Physics Center, um, I believe 1984, maybe 1983, and that was just before the Challenger accident, mm -hmm. which was. So we began to put together a proposal, um, and it was daunting at the top. So yeah, in hindsight, it's all easy and we knew what to do, but but the question was, how do we improve measurements of the Hubble constant, this factor of two that was so unacceptable in the, in the just block to so many mm. things and and so our philosophy was to make the measurements in more than one way because if you only use a single technique then if there's a problem with that technique you can make the measurement as many times as you like but you'll never actually measure the problem because you're going to get the same answer right. to within some statistical uncertainty and so um we use different methods and and we we chose the number of objects to observe to allow us to get a 5% statistical uncertainty. In other words, enough objects that each of those methods could deliver 5% so that we could reach a total goal of 10% for the overall uncertainty in the measurement that we would make. And I think we achieved that goal. So um, this is combining, just maybe to take a back step for the listeners, uh, there is statistical errors, which is to say you can keep measuring something and you will keep improving that, that error bar gets more and smaller the more you measure it. But another totally different type of error that plagues cosmologists is the systematic error. What might be an example of that, just to give some context? Yeah, so an example would be there is dust in the regions between us and the stars that we measure, and we can talk about the types of stars that we use to make these measurements. But the dust has a property that uh, for optical light, uh, it will scatter the light that's on its way to us. So it will make the object look fainter, therefore farther away, and it also makes it uh, redder in color. And so if you make your measurements and don't take account of the dust, you're going to think that your object is farther away. And that has the uh, effect of making your Hubble constant smaller. If mm. your galaxies that you're measuring, you're incorrectly attributing them to be farther away. And so this was one of the examples with photographic plates. There was no way of correcting for the presence of this dust. With CCD detectors, we could make measurements at multiple wavelengths and chart out the effect of the dust, which is wavelength dependent, and actually correct for it. But if you made no correction, which is what happened before, you're systematically wrong. And that was one of the issues that plagued measurement of the Hubble constant to higher accuracy. Yeah, and that that's a... That's a known factor. There must be also be potentially unknown systematics which keep you awake at night as well. Yeah. And um, is there is there any way to guard against those? Are there any of the tests you can do if you if you're given observation? How do you is it is it just thinking about the physics or is there observational tests you can apply to assess how affected you might be by a systematic? Yeah, and I think you know there are these unknown unknowns, right? Mm -hmm. The things you don't even know to worry right. about. And and to my mind, the way you get around those is to make the measurements in a completely independent way. And so that's why when I moved to University of Chicago, I switched from measuring Cepheid variables that we use to measure distances for the key project to another type of star called the red giant branch star, which is the kind of star own sun will eventually evolve into. And, and there are completely different kinds of systematics that would affect those measurements than would affect the Cepheids. And so that's how I think 
you get to the bottom of this. And so either they agree or there is some difference and then you have to understand what's giving rise to the difference. And it gives you some sense of what are the sy potential systematics that are limiting your measurements at the current time. And they're going to be there. So let's take the Cephids as a good case example here. Um, give us the a simplified explanation if you can. I know it's a, it's a complicated topic. How do you take measurements of Cepheids and go to the Hubble constant, the expansion rate of the universe? How does that measurement work? And what is a Cepheid for those who, because yeah. I'm sure most of us are probably wondering <laughs> that, who, who are most of our listeners, yeah. Okay, so let, let me start there. So a Cepheid is a, a kind of star, it's much more massive than the sun. So anywhere from five, say, to 20 times the mass of the sun. So these are stars, because they're more massive, they're actually burning their hydrogen in their cores at a faster rate. The more massive a star is, the shorter lived it is. They also have the property that the outer atmosphere of the star is moving. It's, it's pulsating. It's going in and out on a very regular time scale. And the pulsations can be anywhere from a couple days to up to 100 or so days. And there was an astronomer named Henrietta Leavitt who was working um, the turn of the last century. And she discovered, she was working at the Harvard College Observatory, that there was a relationship between how bright a Cepheid is and how fast its atmosphere is pulsating. So the so-called period luminosity relation now mm. bears her name, the Leavitt Law. And Did it always? Or was no. There? No. We only, I think 2010, we had a resolution that the uh, American Astronomical Society to recognize her because her contribution went ignored. pretty much, it, it was ignored for decades. So, so uh, it was named after a man, presumably beforehand? or It was just the period of the okay. velocity relation. Okay. But everything we've done in cosmology, starting from Hubble and his discovery of galaxies, the expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble Key Project, all depended on measurements of Cepheid. Mm. So she really deserves that recognition. There's a Hubble law, there are Hubble-type galaxies, there's Hubble expansion. I mean, He's got enough. She's got he enough. Need <laughs> and, and you didn't discover the period luminosity <laughs> relation. So it, it's fitting that, that it would be named after her. And it, so if you think about in astronomy, it's not like a physics lab where you go in, you can make a measurement of a of a... Uh, distance or a size, we have to devise ways of using light from distant objects and thereby gauge their distances. So how mm -hmm. do we do that? And the period luminosity relation, the Levitt law, says that if you can measure how bright a Cepheid is in another galaxy, so, so Hubble told us there are Cepheids in other galaxies, he made that discovery, and then you can measure its period. You can do that for many stars in the galaxy because there's this relation. So how apparently bright they are. And then if you can make a measurement of Cepheid, say, in our Milky Way galaxy, where you have the opportunity to use geometry to set the fundamental absolute distance scale, then you simply use the inverse square law of light. So the intensity mm. of light falls off as 1 over distance squared. You measure how bright it appears. You know how bright it absolutely is because of the geometric calibration, and then that gives you the distance. Now, and, then, and then you combine that with a velocity to finally get your expansion rate. To get the yes. Okay, so that's from expansion. a redshift that's measurement right. essentially. So, but it's the distances that prove to be really hard. The velocities you're just measuring mm -hmm. a shift in wavelength, so that's not the limiting factor in measuring the Hubble constant. It's the distances when Hubble first measured. The Hubble constant, named after him, it, you know, he got a value of 500. And now we're talking about a value closer to 70. So you know, way off compared to what he could measure. And so, so were it that simple that it's just the inverse square law of light, we'd be OK. You just beat down the statistical uncertainties by having more objects and making more measurements. But it's the systematic types of effects, the, pres the presence of dust that makes the star look fainter, the presence of um, metals in the atmosphere of the star, so heavy elements that also obscure the light. Um, the fact that we're trying to measure these Cepheids against the background of the galaxy in which they're living. And so they're there's crowding and blending of the stars that are nearby, and they're hard to disentangle and make these measurements accurately. So there are just a number of things. The photographic plates were very um, nonlinear. They, they would saturate low light levels. They were also nonlinear. So there were just problems with the photometry and things that Hubble just couldn't anticipate. So it really has been development of technology that has moved the measurement of distances forward. That's just completely new technology that changed it. So this is measuring, I mean, we talk about these cephids, they must be, 
they can't be on either side of the universe, of course, otherwise we just wouldn't be able to see them, they'd be too faint. Um, these must be galaxies and, and cephids, which are within the local-ish neighborhood of us, maybe, what we're talking, 100 million light years or so? Yeah, roughly 100 million light years. I know you, we normally prefer parsecs, but to, to transition to light years, because mm -hmm. people normally like the light years. Mm -hmm. That's... And, that's local in astronomy yeah that's pretty local. only a hundred million light years right because right. the universe as a whole is something like what 90 billion light, light years, years in in observer observed diameter so it is fairly local and i guess um you are therefore measuring the rate of expansion of the of the nearby universe um what what is the how do we tell the expansion of the of the entire scale of the universe which go beyond that to get to the earliest parts of the universe yeah so partly so the galaxies for which we can make these measurements of cepheids are limited because they're just not bright enough to observe uh, at greater distances. But we also have to tie in to objects that are more distant because not only are galaxies participating in the overall expansion, but they're also interacting with their neighbors. And so that gravitational attraction induces what we call peculiar velocity, the peculiar motions that add scatter to the relationship between velocity and distance. So mm. Hubble made this discovery that velocity is related to the distance. And uh, the nearby galaxies, the, the fraction of the velocity that's contributed by these peculiar motions is much greater for the nearby galaxies that aren't moving as fast. So what we do is we tie into objects like supernovae, a, a certain type of supernova, type 1a supernova, and we can observe those to much greater distances because they're much brighter. And then the peculiar velocities of those objects are much smaller because it's a much smaller fractional contribution to the overall expansion velocity. So the peculiar velocities is just kind of the, the happenstance velocity it has in its own local frame, effectively, whereas the speed you're really interested in is the, the, the expansion of the fabric of space-time itself. And on top of that, there's this inner little motion, which is just an annoyance, essentially, from your yes, perspective. Yes, it's noise. It's scat yeah, just right. noise about the, the experience. And so you get around that by just seeing a lot of them and just mm -hmm. and just averaging out, beating down. So that would be a, a statistical error in that yes. sense. Yes, and you can also model it, but that has its own uncertainties because you have to you know, understand what the assumptions are on the model and, and so on. So it seems like there's, when we look at the agreement, correct me if I'm wrong, the agreement between... Um, Cephids and Type One As, you know, this again, kind of the the nearish universe around us is reasonable. But then this is not the source of the Hubble tension. The Hubble tension really comes down to comparing these Cephids to this the cosmic microwave background. Is that correct? Well, yet yeah, to be clear, so when we measure supernovae, we're only measuring relative distances. And the reason for that is supernovae are rare, so we have no means of attaching an absolute scale to their distances because, mm. for example, we can't use geometry as we do in the Milky Way to, to provide that absolute calibration. Right. So the Cepheids and the tip of the red giant branch provide an intermediate step where we can observe supernovae in the galaxies where we can measure Cepheids and tip of the red giant branch, and then we can use geometric techniques nearby to calibrate the tip of the red giant branch and cepheid. So there are three steps to this process. It's a ladder, so it's not essentially, that, yeah. Yeah, it's a ladder. And it's not that supernovae agree with cepheids. It's that cepheids calibrate I see. the supernovae. Yeah, or they're contingent upon red them. Giant, yeah. They're contingent upon them. Yeah. And red giants calibrate the supernovae. And where the tension comes, there are two tensions. So one is the tension, if you compare the Hubble constant that you get from cepheids as applied to supernovae. So that's part of, you know, cepheids equals cepheids plus supernovae in this discussion. Mm. Then you get 73 approximately for the Hubble constant. So we were talking about 50 and 100 before. Now the cepheids are giving 73 and the microwave background observations, we haven't talked very much about those, but they're giving 67. Mm. So now this gap has narrowed. It's no longer a factor of two. We're talking about the difference between 67 and 73. So that, people at home probably think sounds pretty good. They probably think that sounds like, what's the crisis? That sounds like you're in good agreement Well, and in some other. sense, it's true, right? Yeah. When you think of these measurements <laughs> and what we're trying to do, yeah. pretty difficult measurements, that kind of agreement, especially given the historical difficulty of making the measurements, it is pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think we didn't take enough time to appreciate, <laughs> in a sense, you know, how, how much progress had been made before making claims that, wow, this is, is a controversy that is indicating 
standard model is wrong. But um, so when I went to the University of Chicago, I started measuring these red giant brand stars. Our group uh, started to uh, undertake a calibration completely from scratch, so independent of the Cepheid distance scale. And and so uh, we thought we would either find the same answer as we were getting for the Cepheids, which, so the, the value we got from the key project, by the way, was 72. So so the okay. Cepheids have been consistent for a couple decades now. Okay. And so, but, you know, you make an extraordinary claim, as Carl Sagan said, you want extraordinary evidence. And, and given the historical difficulty of making these measurements, you want to make sure that you've eliminated or minimized the systematics and the systematics you might not know about. So these red giant branch stars offer an opportunity to do that, to test the Cepheids. And so we thought, okay, we're either going to get 73 or 67. And we ended up getting 70. We landed right smack in the middle. Um, okay, so let's let's take a step back. So th these are the tip of the red giant branch stars, a completely independent way of measuring the expansion rate of the universe effectively. Well, really, you're getting a distance, but you convert that into the Hubble constant. Now, the Cepheids, we already, we already spoke a little bit about this, but the problem has been with dust, as an example, that they these are youngish stars. They're like the James Deans of the universe, right? They live fast, die young. And so they tend to be born in the disks of, of their galaxies, I would presume. Um, Not tend to be. Yeah, that's where they form. So right. That's where the gas is and, and that's where they, they're located. So they're, they're embedded in almost the worst possible place yeah. for, from an, an astronomy perspective. And I think with the, the, the TGRBs, the tip of the red giant branch stars, I mean, you, you roll that off so much more easily than I do. Um, <laughs> They, they have a, 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 an advantage here, right? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So the, there's always a first generation of stars that form in a galaxy, right? And, and so disk galaxies like our Milky Way tend to have a disk, <laughs> which make them a disk galaxy. And they're surrounded by a, a, an essentially spherical ha halo of older stars. And, and so the tip of the red giant branch, TRGB stars, uh, reside also in the disk, but in the halo. Mm. as well. And so there's negligible dust in the so halo. So it's like the that, suburbs, the quiet, the quietest part of the galaxy. Yeah, yeah. the quietest, oldest part of the, the galaxy. And, and there's essentially no dust. And the stars are more spread out in the disk. They're much nearer together. And, and so we have these overlapping blending of image problems in the disk. Mm. But the measurements of trying to see how bright is a star, it's much easier when you're not crowded by another star. And so it the tip of the red giant branch method just has that advantage. Uh, we also understand them theoretically really well. We understand why they have the luminosity that they do at the tip and and these questions about whether abundance changes their luminosity. It's a very small effect and it's easy to measure for the tip of the red giant branch stars. It's much more challenging for the Cepheids. So, so it, it, yeah, it's it's a method that has a lot of advantages, and and of course being independent, uh, that's a, another big advantage. It, it must have, in a way, been frustrating because people were claiming then there was this tension that the cosmic microwave background is giving a number of what, 67, something like this. From this yeah. is from like Gaia, from WMAP, these precise cosmology experiments, and then you've got um, the Cepheids and the Type One A, this ladder we spoke about, giving you. 72, 73. And even though they sound similar, they are, depending how you count your errors, many sigma, we would say, apart. So statistically, very significantly apart. And I guess we would hope, we were hoping that you would, your number would land on one side or the other. And we'd be like, okay, so now we know where the problem is. When you realized your answer was right in the middle, uh, were you frustrated by that? How did you feel? Well, someone the immediate reaction was sort of like shock. Really? Did it really right in the <laughs> middle? It was sort of odd. But and we didn't attach this absolute zero point until the end. So we didn't know where this was gonna land. So until we were, you know, ready to apply it and it was that was it. It was like one morning, here's the answer and it was so it was slightly a shock, I would I would yeah. say. But but then when you think about it, given the uncertainties in any given method, it's perfectly reasonable. Uh, and so if you compare what we got for the tip of the red giant branch with the microwave background observations, they're statistically very consistent. Mm -hmm. um, if you compare the tip of the red giant branch with the Cepheids, they're also consistent given the uncertainty. Because you're between them, yeah. And so what it's telling you is 
I think something important, which is, okay, if you're going to interpret the difference between the microwave background and Cepheids as telling you something fundamental about the universe, but then you go and you make measurements, especially when you do them in the same galaxies using two different techniques, Cepheids and tip of the red giant branch, and you get a difference, well, that's telling you, you better understand what that difference is, is arising from because that's not fundamental physics, right? That's mm. either something about the stars, you know, maybe we're learning something about astrophysics and, and Cepheids in general and tip of the red giant branch stars, or there are hidden systematics. And not that hidden because it's not that big of a difference statistically. Yeah. And, and I guess- Not unreasonable is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. And so is there hope of, at the moment you're in the middle, but there's a sizable uncertainty on it. It's a little, I think it's a little bit larger than the Cepheid uncertainty, although it depends how you, uh, count your systematics is there hope of squeezing that error down and getting to a point where we should then see either a tension or a resolution yeah and, and, and yeah that's why i'm really excited right now is that so we're now in the james webb space telescope realm and uh our group got time in the first cycle to make uh, observations, not just of Cepheids, not just of tip of the red giant branch stars, but both of them in mm. the same galaxy and an additional third method. So all three methods, same galaxies. And uh, James Webb in the near infrared has three times the resolution that the infrared camera on Hubble has. And so it's like putting on eyeglasses, literally. <laughs> and so when we look at the images that were observed with Hubble and we see, you know, very um, low signal measurements with lots of stars around crowding the images and then we look at the james webb images and it has 10 times the sensitivity of hubble so these things come booming through they're you know really clear they're not crowded and uh, we also can look for systematic effects like differences in abundance that uh, historically have been an issue for the cepheids right, so right. i think we're going to learn an enormous amount um so e even up. though it's only, it, and you're not doing hundreds of galaxies, just a few galaxies, of course it'd be great if we could do more, <laughs> but if we just, given the, the constraints of the time, um, with those few galaxies, that'll essentially give you, you're looking at the same galaxy, so you should get the same distance, and any difference then, you can use that difference to sort of back calibrate all the previous data and, and figure out what's yeah, going on. Yeah, I think on. several things. One is... No not only should we get the same distance, right? A galaxy has a single distance, yeah, right? Yeah. So if we find a difference, that's not fundamental physics of the early universe, mm -hmm. right? We know it's at that distance, or you know, it should be, I'm using should again. But <laughs> a, so either they're going to agree, or if, if the difference persists, we're going to see that, okay, this is something fundamental we don't yet understand about these kinds of stars. And that's a nice thing about having the third independent method because you know, that may shed some light, either increase the scatter or agree with one or, or the other, or maybe all three will agree when you can beat down the systematics. So we don't know where it's going to land, but either way, we're going to learn something interesting. We just have to wait and see what comes out of this then. I'm excited to see. I mean, there must be lots of theorists who are um, hoping that you will see differences, right? They are sure. <laughs> they are probably rubbing their fingers, expecting a difference, and hoping for that because that's that's a far more interesting paper. Right? If there really was a difference, maybe you can just speak briefly. What what would be the possible explanation for the Hubble tension? If the early universe really does seem to have a distinct expansion rate to the modern universe. What's going on? How do we how do we make sense of that? Yeah, so there have been a lot of ideas put forward. It's interesting how many ideas have been put forward. And what's really, I think, uh, important is that the data now have become so good that it constrains most of these models. They just don't work. And mm. so that's good. They're being confronted. What is, uh, I think, interesting at the moment that is still consistent with the data that exists for the microwave background is a model that has a, an early type of dark energy. So we're talking about the dark energy before that um, is causing the, the universe to accelerate. And, and so the idea is that you would say you start another kind of acceleration early in the universe before it would have any effect on the peaks in the microwave background that are now mm. being measured really accurately, which is how this determination of the Hubble constant uh, is made. So it's like a few hundred thousand years of the age of the universe, so yeah, before so that time. 380,000 years after the Big Bang is when we measure the, the surface, as it's called, the last scattering, when we can first mm -hmm. see the radiation uh, emerging from the Big Bang. So this would have to happen before that. And, and then it would have to disappear, which is sort of a little bit con contrived, mm. right? You have to posit that there was this 
expansion for some reason happening exactly right time that it would have no effect on what we can already measure really well. And then it has to disappear right at the right time. But there's a, a very, um, not, you know, not a large signal, but there's a hint in some of the cosmic microwave background measurements now that maybe there's evidence for, for this kind of early expansion. But now the data are getting so good again. So in the next few years, they're going to be release of new data on the microwave background that if this is real, it's going to be a booming signal mm. and, you know, no question, or it's going to you know, disappear into the noise. So that we talk about sigma, we mentioned that word before, but, you know, two or three sigma effects where people talk about statistical significance of a difference at two or three sigma, often those disappear when yeah. you get better data. And so we'll, we'll see. Um, and, you know, if it isn't that, people are creative. They'll come up with other possibilities, and those will be eventually confronted by data. And there's an answer to this question. And the question is, you know, when will we have the answer? And, and I don't think we're there yet, but what excites me is that there's so much data that is, it, this is going to get so much better in the next several years that I think yeah. we'll be able to say something really interesting. And then finally, um, the future of cosmology. I remember when I was uh, studying astrophysics at Cambridge, a professor told me, don't study cosmology. It's all figured out. <laughs> it's not that just all they're doing now is measuring these constants to more and more precision. And I, I think in hindsight, that advice was totally wrong. Um, but do you, there's all, I guess people say the same thing about exoplanets. Like the, there was a gold rush period 20 years ago. And, and young people always want to know maybe there's some listening today thinking about getting into astronomy. Um, is the gold rush over? Is the future of cosmology? going to be just improving these measurements to ever greater precision? Um, or is there going to be new vistas in cosmology you're expecting, new transformations thanks to these giant Magellan telescopes, these 30-meter glass things we're building on the ground, or future space-based telescopes, James Webb um, programs that you're working on? What do you see in, the, in your crystal ball? For, I know it's hard to do that, but in the crystal ball of cosmology, do you, would you think this is a great field to be getting into as a young person and what to expect? You know, I think, well, we often see these end of history books that are written or end of science books <laughs> that you know, coinciding with millennia changes or whatever. But I think if I look ahead to the field and there are things like the, the Rubin telescope that's going to be coming online surveying the sky uh, to unprecedented depth and time resolution and so on. And and the big telescopes that are going to follow up those observations and the James Webb Space Telescopes and improvement in Gaia and what's going to happen in future in space and you know LIGO and its measurement of gravitational waves. And I just don't see this field ending right now. Mm -hmm. And I think any time we've gotten greater capability in astronomy, we learn something, we make yeah. discoveries, and I don't know where those will come. And I think in general in science, fields do dry up for a while often. You, know, you make progress as far as you can make because your technical capability doesn't allow you to go farther, but then you get a next jump and then maybe you learn something interesting again. But uh, so where that will go, I think in terms of describing the universe and our understanding of essentially a basic model of cosmology. Uh, there are still things we can learn. We'll see what those are, including maybe we'll say this is a pretty good standard model and and you know it's time to work on other things. Um, but there are plenty of things in cosmology that we're going to learn about in these large surveys. I think it's just uh, the ability that the statistical, the improvement in statistical precision and size of these surveys and the ability to, to study on larger scales, I think it's just going to, it's going to open up a new world. So peel back the onion, see another layer, peel back the onion. Yeah. And, and I think again, you know, it, it's starting out in the field and what was possible to measure and, and, you know, we haven't talked very much about the microwave background, but theoretically it was predicted that there would be oscillations in the early universe, essentially ability to measure sound waves in the early universe. But no one thought that this was going to be technically feasible because the perturbations are so small. It's like a thousandth of a percent. And now we make these observations routinely. And, mm. uh, and the um, capability of the detectors and then the size of, of the instruments that are being built that just sort of 
tens of thousands of detectors, literally. I mean, we couldn't have imagined this when I started. So I don't even know how to imagine what, what the next generation is going to be and what will take place in space and interferometry. And it's, it's, so the field is anything. But, so whether it's particularly an area of this area of cosmology or exoplanets or where that will be, I don't have a crystal ball. But in terms of new discoveries, I think it's, it's a possibilities are, I mean, endless is a bad word, but you know, it's a, it's an exciting time. Yeah. It seems like a bottomless pit. Um, I'm, my only regret is that we have to share the JWST with, with our cosmologists and we just need <laughs> several of them, right? For all yeah, of the the share. exoplanets <laughs> weren't really around when we started planning JWST. So you guys are the one who moved We're in and sort of, we have to compete yeah. with you now. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Which so is great. <laughs> this was wonderful, Wendy. I've really enjoyed, I've learned a lot and I hope our listeners learn a lot. This was a lot of fun learning about the Hubble tension. Maybe we don't need to panic just yet, but we will be listening out for the James Webb program and hopefully we will have some clearer answers about what's really going on in the universe fairly soon from it. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks, it was a pleasure. So that was my conversation with the legendary Professor Wendy Friedman, a true giant of the field and really an honor to get to speak with her and I hope you enjoyed learning all about the crisis in cosmology, the Hubble tension, as well as just the approach that scientists and astronomers have to have in understanding these evolving and controversial topics. For me, one of the most standout moments of that conversation was the question I posed to her, how do you deal with the unknown systematics? And there was a very simple answer to that that she posed that I really loved, and that was that you use several independent methods. Now that's important not just in science, but I think in our whole philosophy, our whole approach to life. You could have one trusted or apparently trusted source of determining something. It could be a friend, it could be a parent, it could be a newspaper or a YouTube personality such as myself even, and they might tell you something, but don't just blindly accept it. And in that case in science, it was the Cepheids, right? So we have this method of measuring the expansion rate of the universe, the Cepheids, which we think we understand exquisitely well. We think we can correct for all of these subtle effects, the blending of other stars, the dust contamination in the galaxy. We think we can correct for that and get a reliable answer. And maybe we are. Maybe the answer we're getting really is the right answer. But it's also possible there are things that we don't understand. And so why not do a double check or even a triple check? Use a completely different method See if you get the same answer. If all of them line up, then hey, you completely understood the problem. But maybe you might found something profound, as Friedman and others have found, that there seem to be differences between these different methods of measuring the same thing, telling us something that maybe we don't fully understand this problem, either the measurements themselves or the universe itself. And I think that lesson of independent checks is as crucial in science as it is in our lives. So I hope you got some wisdom out of that conversation as well. Maybe it was that, maybe it was something else. And I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you did and you enjoy these podcasts, then of course, please do look out for future episodes. We have many more great guests coming down the line. If you are interested in supporting and think we deserve it, the Cool Worlds podcast, then probably the best way is to head to coolworldslab.com slash support. That's coolworldslab.com slash support. That is a way of supporting my research team. So if you support my research team, it allows me to not have to write so many proposals and grants and gives me more time to focus on making these podcasts and these YouTube episodes for you. And so the research grant stuff, we can kind of let take care of itself. I also love the fact that if you are supporting us, your money is not going into my pocket. It's going into the research team itself. Every dollar you put in goes into supporting real research in my team. I hope that's an interesting possibility for you. It's a great way of supporting what we do. And I hope, more importantly, that you enjoy these episodes that we're making for you. So until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious. <laughs>